Hello everyone, it's Spawnpoint and this is the iPhone SE, Apple's 2022 budget iPhone. Now this is marketed as the cheapest and most affordable phone to buy right now, but is it actually any good? Well, let me show you if this little phone is worth buying, including the performance that it's packing and the features that it's still missing. I'll even compare it to the iPhone 13 mini and the iPhone 11 to give you an idea of its capability and whether it's worth spending a little bit more for something else. So the iPhone SE is actually based on the 2017 iPhone 8 design. It's got the rounded edges and the chunky bars at the top and bottom of the screen. Now when the screen is off, you cannot really tell, but as soon as you switch it on, it instantly looks like an old iPhone that we've all seen before. There's the home button or the touch ID. Now this is something that we've not seen for about five years or so on the non SE models. And considering how much we've gotten used to face ID, I actually quite like having this button back. It's fast, it's responsive, and there's definitely something satisfying about pressing this button instead of swiping up to unlock or return to the home screen. But one of the biggest selling points of the iPhone SE other than the price is the size. This phone is tiny. It's about the same size as an iPhone 13 mini. Now phones are getting bigger every year. It's what a lot of us want. Being able to watch movies, take and edit photos, or just check in your social media. But it's not what everyone wants from a phone. And that's what makes this iPhone so appealing. It will easily fit into your pocket and you can use it one-handed. Plus other than the borders on the front, it's got a pretty nice rear. So I've got the midnight color here, which looks really nice. Although I think the red is probably the better choice. But like with every phone, I'd always use it with a case. Now I can imagine the rear of this phone getting scratched very easily, as I do remember my old iPhones back in the day did as well. Right, okay, so let's take a look at the screen. So it's packing a 4.7 inch Retina HD LCD display. So it's not full HD, unfortunately. The PPI of 326 is okay. So everything looks sharp and pretty clear for a screen of this size. Now looking at it in almost every lighting condition shows that it's very easily viewable. I mean, it's no OLED, but the colors look vibrant. The brightness does max out at 600 nits though. So viewing it in direct sunlight isn't great, but then not many phones can handle that anyway. It's got a 60 hertz screen, which feels responsive. Obviously it's lacking that 120 hertz screen, but only the latest 13 Pro models have that. Now, one of the biggest issues I have found with this screen, though, are the black bars. I don't mean those at the top and the bottom. I got used to those pretty quickly, but I'm talking about the sides. So if you watch a movie that you would normally expect to fill the entire screen, you're going to see these black bars on the sides as well. Now, I thought I could pinch to zoom, but it appears that you cannot do that either. Now, what that does mean is that 4.7 inch screen has suddenly gotten a lot smaller when watching movies. Not a huge issue, but something definitely worth mentioning. And over the last week, I've used it for a handful of different apps, including Instagram, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Overall, it's not a bad experience of a screen of this size. Every app loads and looks good, but you can definitely tell that they are optimized for larger screens. I feel that I'm having to scroll more to view the same content that I would expect to see on a different phone. Around the back, you'll notice it's only got one camera, and that's a single 12 megapixel wide lens. It's got an f1.8 aperture, optical image stabilization, and a five times digital zoom. There's no optical zoom here. The photos you're able to take with this are a lot better than I expected. You get the normal modes like portrait and panoramic, but it's also got the new picture modes or the photography style mode that we saw in 2021. Viewing the photos you've taken on the phone look okay, but viewing the same photos on another display or here and now is where you really see how good the full image quality is. Again, for a camera this size and the pixel count, I'm really impressed with it. The clarity won't be as good as the latest Pro models, obviously, but for its price range, it's decent. And with the right lighting conditions, it performs really well. Even in low light, it looks good. However, it does not have night mode, so taking photos in the dark will not get the results that you'd hope for. But here are a few photos I've taken with the iPhone SE, and I've edited them in Lightroom to show you what it can do. Now, as I've mentioned multiple times before, all of the videos on this channel are filmed with an iPhone. So I was interested to see what the video capability was like on the SE. Now, it does support up to 4K video recording and up to 240 frames per second, depending on the mode that you're using. The mode that I shoot in is 4K30. And here's some of the footage that I've taken over the last week with this phone. And what do you think? I think this looks really good for 4K quality and especially coming out of this tiny little camera. Now it doesn't have the latest cinematic mode or HDR video recording, but the full 4K image quality is good. I mean, I've said this before for years, if you want to start a channel on YouTube, just use the phone that you've got in your pocket and you could definitely use this iPhone SE to make content with. In terms of the performance of this, well, you'll be pleased and maybe even surprised to hear that it's specced with the latest A15 Bionic chip. And that's the same chip as found in the iPhone 13, which is absolutely crazy. Now that might not sound like a big deal, but it really is. Forget about the screen and forget about the camera. That means this is packing a chip that will future-proof this phone for at least another three to four years. It'll keep getting the latest iOS updates. Apps will run faster and it shouldn't lag or slow down. And that's one of the biggest issues with going for a cheaper phone is it'll tend to slow down and become almost unusable whereas this chip will overcome that issue. And that's what makes this on a performance level a better buy than say an iPhone 11 or iPhone 12, because those phones will pack more features, but overall the performance will be lower. 
The fact that it's got the A15 chip means it feels like a wolf in sheep's clothing. It looks old, but it's as fast as the latest iPhone 13. It's also rocking 5G, which is very impressive for a budget phone. Another huge talking point about these phones are the batteries. You kind of want or even need a phone that will last you from morning to night. You don't really want to be worrying about charging at midday. So over the last week, I have been using this to see how long it would last me under normal conditions. Nothing too heavy, but here are the results. So I've averaged around six to seven hours of daily use. That's included checking emails, social media, and using the camera to record some of these videos. I'm happy with that for such a small phone. Now, Apple actually suggests around 10 to 15 hours of video playback, which I reckon I would struggle with. But if you wanted to use it for more demanding tasks, like gaming or watching content, I would imagine the battery would drain very, very quickly. But when it comes to charging it, it's got a lightning port at the bottom and it does support wireless charging. Not MagSafe though, I have tried this and it will simply just slide off. Looking at the available storage options and prices, well, it comes in a 64, 128, and 256 gigabytes. The prices are on screen too. The budget buy is definitely the 64 gigabytes, but if you were planning on using it for storing games, movies, and music on, this will fill up pretty quickly. So upping it to the 128 or the 256 would make more sense, but with that comes an increased cost. But if you just need a phone to make calls or send messages and check your social media, the base model is absolutely fine. So how does the iPhone SE compare to some of the other cheaper iPhones such as the iPhone 11 or the 13 mini? Well, the iPhone 11 starts at 489 and that's for the 64 gigabyte storage. That's already 70 pounds more than the SE, but it has got a bigger screen, the ultra wide lens, larger battery, face ID, and the newer and more modern phone design. It also has a larger and better liquid retina display, but it is missing two things over the iPhone SE and that's 5G and the latest A15 chip as it's still got the 2019 A13 chip. And then there's the iPhone 13 mini. Now this is technically smaller than the iPhone SE, but it's got a larger OLED screen, better lenses, the same A15 chip, better battery and MagSafe capability. But with those extra features, it's going to cost you £679. Now this is for the 128GB version, which means like for like is about £210 more than the SE. So if you want the cheapest iPhone that lets you get into the Apple ecosystem, take videos, check your social media, listen to music or message your friends, the iPhone SE is great. But if you want a small phone that's packing everything you could possibly need, including the OLED screen, multiple cameras, the same A15 chip and 5G, the 13 mini is probably the better choice. It will cost you more, but overall it is better. Ultimately, it comes down to your budget and what you need from a phone. And if you were wondering what we get inside the box, well, it comes with the phone, the USB-C to lightning cable, a SIM card remover, and the Apple stickers. Just like with previous iPhones, there's no power brick or plug. So you'll need to buy one of those separately if you don't have one. So yeah, I think the iPhone SE is a great budget phone. It's the cheapest 2022 iPhone that you can buy right now, and it's packing that same A15 chip as found in the 13. That means it's a powerful phone at an affordable price. The only thing that really lets this phone down, in my opinion, is the front. The black bars on that 2017 design. If they'd gone for a 10R design, that would make the perfect budget phone that looks nice and it's rapid. If you're upgrading from an older iPhone, such as an iPhone 8 or older again, this will feel like a huge step up in terms of performance. It could make the perfect phone for children, as well, where the larger and more expensive iPhones might not be suitable. Plus, not everyone needs the extra features such as multiple cameras, OLED, MagSafe, and HDR. And some do actually want that physical home button, which you'll only get from this phone. But what about you? Would you recommend the iPhone SE to someone looking for the cheapest phone to buy? Or would you go for an older model, such as the iPhone 11, or something completely different? So that was my review of the 2020 iPhone SE. Thank you for watching. And if you drop a nice budget phone in the comments, I know you're still here right at the end. If you did enjoy today's video, check out my six month review of the iPhone 13 Pro Max. And in that video, I talk about my ownership so far and why it is the best phone that I've ever used. If you haven't already, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and turn those notifications on so you don't miss my next upload. You can also follow me over on Instagram and Twitter. Until next time.